All right, welcome everyone to the start of the type two track today. My name's Trisha Santos. I hope I already met you all this morning. Um, this is Dr. Schaefer Bader. Schaefer is um, one of our endocrinologists and diabetes specialists at UCSD. Dr. Edelman introduced him in his talk this morning. Schaefer works very closely with myself and Dr. Edelman and Dr. Pettis. He sees patients with um, diabetes in the hospital and then also does diabetes research. Um, so he's a diabetes specialist and we are here to do our very first shared medical appointment. So in 25 years, this has never been done at TCOID. So we're really excited about this. Like I said, we do shared medical appointments at UCSD and we've learned a lot. And one of the biggest things is that we can all learn from each other. So this is gonna be kind of like a, an appointment where hopefully we can teach you a lot of what we've learned from patients and from working with patients for so long. So the first thing we wanna do is figure out what is most important to you. And one of the things I wanna talk about is we're not just talking about medications at this medical appointment that we're having this morning. We're talking about lots of different issues with type two diabetes. So I'm gonna read through these and we're gonna try and get a sense of what's most important to you and then start with those sessions um, and then hopefully get through all of them today. So I want you to raise your hand if this is a particularly tough topic for you or difficult topic for you, um, and then we'll get a sense of how important it is. But you're allowed to vote more than once, so you know, vote as many times as you want. If you all vote for all of them, we'll just kind of go through. Um, but we'll see what's important. So anybody feel like this? I don't like checking my blood sugar. It hurts, and I don't like to see the high numbers. Okay, so a lot of people feel that way. What about, I don't take my meds all the time, um, but I'm afraid to tell my doctor. Anybody feel like that? Okay, we have some people who feel like that. My diet is awful because I love carbs too much. Who doesn't love carbs? Oh, that's a popular one. Okay, what about I don't wanna take insulin, it means I'm doing a bad job with my diabetes and also I hate needles or I hate needles. Okay, have some takers there. If I could lose weight, I think that would help my diabetes, but dieting's hard. Okay, another really popular one. See, I told you, sometimes medicines aren't the most important thing, yeah. right? I have heart disease and I wanna reduce my risk for heart attacks and strokes. Okay, we have some people of interest there. And what about I'm having low blood sugars? Anybody ever have lows? Some of you out there with lows. Okay, I think it seems like the diet and the weight are most popular. What do you think, Schaefer? Yeah, that makes yeah. Sense. okay, so why don't I start with diet and then maybe you can take weight. I like it. Does that sound good? Sounds perfect. Okay, so we are gonna start with diet. I'm gonna put us on the next slide. Oops. Whoops. Sorry. Sorry, we both advanced at the same time. Okay, so you guys really, we saw a lot of hands for this one. So my diet is awful, I love carbs way too much. How many people think you can't eat carbs if you have diabetes? Has anybody been told this? It's over, no more carbs. That's just not true. You can actually eat carbs even if you have diabetes. The goal is to limit your carbs to a reasonable amount with each meal. So if you're on mealtime insulin, Anybody on insulin with their meals? So not everybody is. You should have kind of a, a limit to how many carbs you eat per meal. And if you're on mealtime insulin, you wanna make sure you're eating the carbs at the meal because that's when the insulin's gonna cover you. Okay, so what we tell our patients is to aim for about 45 to 60 grams of carb per meal. And you may say, well, thanks a lot, but how much is that? I don't even know what that means. So I'm gonna tell you, here's some examples. 15 grams of carbs is one carb serving, and you can have three to four of these per meal, okay? So 15 grams is one slice of bread, a small piece of fruit, like an apple or a small orange, 10 Skittles, that's kind of annoying, that's not very many Skittles, <laughs> right? Okay, um, 10 french fries, also annoying. Um, a half a cup of ice cream, but you get the idea here, right? If you wanna eat 40 french fries, fine, but that's your carb serving for that meal right? So it's everything in moderation here. If you have a regular sandwich with regular bread, not one of those like giant sub breads, 
but like two slices of kind of your average bread and no other carbs in there, that's only half of your carbs for that meal, that little sandwich. So you can eat carbs, it's just about the moderation. What about pasta? This is one of my favorite carbs. Now pasta, 15 grams of carbs or one serving, is a third a cup of pasta. Have you guys seen a third of a cup lately? It's like real small, okay? So you can see what this looks like, the cup next to the tennis ball for kind of an eyeball size. But if you, if you eat, you can do four of those for one serving. So maybe a little more than half of this plate of pasta. Okay, so you can eat it, it's just about moderation again. Rice is another one that has a lot of carbs. So if you look at the left-hand picture here, you can see that a half a cup of rice is about 27 grams of carbs. So that's half of your carbs for a meal, just a half a little cup there. One of the things you can try to substitute is cauliflower rice. Okay, this is where they chop up cauliflower real small so it tastes like rice and looks like, it, it doesn't taste as much like rice, I'll be honest, but it looks like rice. And what's the best part of rice? The oh. sauce, right? So whatever sauce is soaking in that rice, you can do that with cauliflower rice. And what you can see is it's way less carbs. So for a half a cup of cauliflower rice, it's only five grams of carbs. These are some options with cauliflower rice. My favorite is on the left. I, this is what I buy, it's at Trader Joe's. It's only $2.50 for a whole bag of rice. This will feed your whole family. Um, and then you can cook it however you want. There's cauliflower pizza crust. Trader Joe's also makes a cauliflower fried rice, like a stir fry with veggies and other things in there. So you can try all of those. And if you really need help counting carbs because you're not used to it, get an app on your phone. A lot of people have smartphones these days. These are some ideas for apps. My fitness pal, Calorie King, can tell you the carbs. One of the apps we find our patients like a lot, and this comes up in our shared medical appointments, is Figwe. Now you do have to pay for it. I think it's $1.99. But the nice thing about it is it has, do you know sometimes when you're on these nutrition apps and it says, well, four ounces of chicken. It's like, what's four ounces of chicken? I don't even know. But this shows you a picture of whatever you're eating, a burrito, pizza, pasta, rice. And you have a little arrow that you can move up and down, like, I ate that much pizza. And then it'll just keep adding slices or slices of peaches or whatever you're eating. And you can visually look at the food and get an idea of how much you're eating and then look at the carbs underneath so it can show you there. So I love that. The other thing you can do is try to not to eat carbs for your snacks, okay? So eat those carbs at the meal time, like we said. In between meals, go for no carb or really low carb. So these are things like beef jerky, deli meats, avocado, which is really filling, um, cheese, like string cheese or any type of cheese, um, pickles, vegetables, nuts. All those things have very low or no carbs and they're great snack ideas. Now this, Schaefer, tell me if you agree. 100%. With our patients, he knows what I'm gonna say. This is the easiest way to cut carbs for all of our patients, hands down, is when you are drinking your carbs, it really makes your blood sugar go up, and it's the easiest thing to switch. So almost every type of drink these days has a low carb option. There's diet soda, there's these buy drinks that have a different type of sweetener in them. There's Gatorade that comes no carbs, Snapple, Crystal Light, has lemonade and iced tea and fruit punch and all sorts of options. So this is a really, really easy way to reduce your carbs and I guarantee your blood sugars will go down. And then lastly, I just wanted to share, this is an example of one of my patients um, who I told, okay, I want you to eat 45 to 60 grams per meal and she, really took it to heart, she said, okay, I'm gonna start writing down everything, and then she brought me back her log book. Of, she was keeping a dietary log, which is a lot of work, and she said, I'm so proud of myself because I'm eating, I'm keeping those carbs to 45 to 60 grams per meal. And here's what it is, so this is her breakfast. She had a Slim Jim, that was only eight grams of carbs. Then she had two York peppermint patties, that was 26 grams of carbs. And she had two pe Reese's peanut butter cups, 20 grams, and Andy's mint candy. She even logged her Diet Pepsi, which is zero carbs. Um, but guess what I said to her? Good job, <laughs> because you're keeping it to, now, is this the healthiest breakfast? No, but she, the, she's trying so hard, and I think 
this is all we can do. You know, this is actually a lot less carbs than she was eating, and her blood sugars came way down. So I'm not advocating that you have candy for breakfast, um, but anyway. Okay, so that's, that's kind of our take home points on um, diet and carbs. I think the next topic that um, you guys really, re we saw a lot of hands go up, was about weight, I think. Do you want to talk do about weight, weight loss? Schaefer? Here you go. All right. Thank you. Okay, let's do the weight loss section. So, if I could lose weight, I think that would help my diabetes, but dieting is hard. So, we just heard about some of the ways to diet. Um, the ways to think about diet, but when, when, you know, when we talk about dieting, uh, we're, you know, we're not talking about going on a diet and trying to lose weight, and then once you hit that weight, forgetting about it and going back to your diet, right? So this is all about lifestyle change and finding things that you can change and maintain over time. So this is exactly the kind of stuff that Trish is talking about. You can eat all the foods you like, um, but do it in moderation, and it's choosing ways that you can actually cut down on the carbohydrates and for weight loss, just as important as carbohydrates are calories um, that you can maintain over time. So let's talk a little bit how to do that. All right, so losing weight and keeping it off. It, it's really, really hard. It's, a, it's one of the hardest things to do, and, and honestly, no one's figured out a way to do it across the board. So it, it, there's no shortcuts to this, okay? So it's one of the best things you can do for your diabetes control because as uh, Trish mentioned earlier, if you start losing weight, then actually your insulin resistance gets better. So your blood sugars get better. Um, so it may mean that you need less medications to get the same blood sugar control. Um, and importantly, it's just good for your overall health. So losing weight is good for you, okay? And everyone knows that. Uh, what goes into losing weight? So diet, in other words, nutrition, what you're eating, exercise or physical activity, and um, also medications. So sometimes the medications are a piece that we don't think about enough, that we don't talk about. And then again, sort of the key to this, and this is simpler, sim similar to what Dr. Bill Polanski said this morning, you have to come up with a takeaway. So think of something that's simple and sustainable, you know, maybe one change that you wanna do to help yourself lose weight, and, and start with that. All right, so we just talked about sort of quote unquote diet and, and nutrition. So, but to touch on that again, in, ter in terms of thinking about it from a weight loss standpoint, first of all, there's no such thing as a diabetic diet, okay? And there's no magic diet that's gonna fix everything in a healthy way where you're gonna lose a ton of weight and keep it off forever. There's no magic diet pills. There's really no shortcuts to this, okay? And so we know that this is difficult and the, the key is to make small changes slowly, okay? So just like Dr. Santos said, eat what you like but in moderation. So thinking about portion control, that's kind of a buzzword, right? You're, you can eat different foods, but think about the portion size. So instead of having that whole plate of pasta, maybe you're having a, a quarter of a plate. And ultimately, less calories is how you lose weight. So you have to eat less calories. And that's something that's been around for a long time. We've always known that to be the case. People have tried to work around this, and there's not really another way to do it. Okay, so it's cutting down on the calories. All right, exercise, not extra fries. <laughs> exercise, you know, what is, what is exercise doing here? So, it, so if we exercise, okay, it's gonna, it actually will improve your blood sugars just by exercising. So some of you may know that, hey, if you go for a walk, maybe you'll see your blood sugars come down, okay? So, so in and of itself, it's actually, exercise is good for diabetes and, it, and it's good for your blood sugars. It's good for your heart um, and your vascular system. So just exercising will reduce your chances of having heart attacks and strokes and these things down the road. So getting physical activity um, is important for that reason as well. Uh, exercise can improve sleep, mood, energy, and even your sex life. These have all been studied. And so it's just one of these things that it's hard to do, but I think most people will say, hey, once, when I am exercising, I feel better. Um, and it's true. Now what about weight loss? is exercise the key to weight loss? And I always um, like to just kind of take a moment and, and, and have people think about this a little bit. The problem with exercise is a lot of times you go and you exercise and you know as soon as you're done exercising, you're starving. So what do you want to do? I mean, you just want to eat food. And a lot of times people will exercise or increase their activity levels, but then they just increase their calories because they're hungrier, so you eat more. So you have to be careful with that. So exercise is, is not the number one way to lose weight. Right? So it has to be sort of 
in concert with or along with cutting back on your calories. So it's, it's just something to be conscious about. So I want you to exercise, it's good for you, but it's not the number one approach to weight loss. What can you do for exercise? Exercise isn't necessarily that you're you know, going to CrossFit or running a marathon, those are great exercises, but it's really just physical activity that's important. So whether it's, uh, you know, you, you wanna find something that you like to do and that you know, isn't a chore for you. If you hate going to the gym, I wouldn't choose that as your exercise, right? Find something that you enjoy, whether it's walking with friends, going on bike rides, um, like if you like to dance, run, bike, swim, uh, aerobics, any of these things. So find something that you actually enjoy that makes you feel good and that you can kind of make a regular part of your life. That's how you can build exercise into your weight loss program and your general health. Okay, diabetes medications. Now this is actually a relatively new area um, to think about for weight loss. So it used to be that we would have things like sulfonylureas, which are uh, uh, like glipizide and gliburide um, and insulin. And those medicines tend to kind of promote weight gain, okay? So you're kind of in, stuck in the situation. If you have high blood sugars and your doctor's telling you to take these medicines to bring your blood sugars down, but you're fighting the weight gain. And that's a, and that's a real struggle. And as your weight goes up, then you're needing more insulin. And so it, that really is a cycle that sometimes people get frustrated about. So now we have other medications that can really help. Now, of course, metformin's been around for a long time, and metformin is generally our number one go-to medicine before we add anything else. But metformin, thankfully, is weight neutral. And in some cases, it might actually have a little bit of a weight loss benefit. So by taking metformin, you may be able to drop your weight a little bit just, just by the metformin alone. The DPP-4 inhibitors, these are medicines like Genuvia and Trigenta, tend to be uh, weight neutral. So people don't gain weight. You don't really lose weight with them, but they, you also don't gain weight. So these are good options for people when you're trying not to gain weight. What about actual weight loss? So we're gonna keep coming back to these uh, two classes of medications today. We've already heard about them from Dr. Santos. You're gonna hear about them again later on in the day. But the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the SGLT2 inhibitors, and I've just listed out the brand names of those medicines there. Both of these classes of medicines that are both relatively new uh, promote weight loss. And so um, these would be the types of things that, hey, if you're not on one of these med medications, um, but you're trying to lose weight and you're on other diabetes meds, it may be reasonable to ask your provider and say, hey, is one of these medicines right for me? Can it help me lose weight? Um, can we swap it out for one of the medicines I'm on right now? Okay. What you know, the other thing about these, if, if you want to hear more about weight loss today, there is a whole afternoon session on it as well if you want a little more detail um, to learn more about these medications, other options as well. All right, what do you think to talk about next, Schaefer? Those were the, definitely the two most popular. You can't find us, here we are, okay. Well. So let's see, I think we had quite a few hands saying I'm afraid to be honest with my doctor. Let's talk about okay. that one, it's kind okay. of a tough, a tough Okay, one. I'm gonna, I'll take this one, okay. I'll take the uh, pointer from you. All right, so I don't take my medications all the time. Um, maybe you take them, maybe you miss them a few times a week, um, but I'm afraid to be honest with my doctor. And a lot of people feel like this when they go to the doctor's office, right? You feel kind of shameful, like you're at the principal's office, you know you did something wrong, you don't really wanna go. And what I'd say is, we can't help you if we don't know the truth, okay? So you really, if you're not taking all of your medication, it can actually it, be dangerous to you if you pretend like you are. Because then, if your provider, your doctor, your nurse practitioner thinks that you're taking all of your medication and your A1C is still above goal, they may add another medication that you may or may not take, that now you have to pay a copay for, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they may increase your dose of your current medication. They may start insulin or increase your insulin dose. And then what happens is if one day you decide to take all of these things, it could really end up in trouble and you could have low blood sugars. So it's really can be more dangerous for you to not be honest with your doctor. But I get it if you feel like you can't be honest. So what do you think, which one of these glucose logs do you think is best? Take, these are back from patients in 2013. Um, but let's take a look. I know they're kind of dark and hard to see, but you can see certainly the numbers look pretty good on the one on the right. Um, the numbers are a little more all over the place on the left, some 200, some low. What do you guys think? I agree with you, the left. 
So the one on the right makes me nervous. You know why? It's way too clean, okay? For those of you that have been keeping glucose logs, when do you check your blood sugar? Before you eat, there's food all over it, there's blood all over it from pricking your finger, right? The one on the, on the right really looks suspicious. So it's way too clean. Most of the numbers end in zero or five, which is just statistically impossible, okay? That all of your numbers are like 140, 110, 130, 120, 145. So just looks suspicious, right? So I much prefer to see the numbers that are all over the place because then I can do something about it. Be honest not only about what medications you're taking, tell us what you're eating. If you don't tell us you're drinking a six pack of regular Coke every day, then we can't help you drink four of those instead, right? So I have a lot of patients that say, well, I eat you know, four tortillas at every meal. And it's unreasonable for me to say, stop eating tortillas. So I just say, okay, do you think you could eat three tortillas at every meal? And then that will help a lot, but I can't help make that change if I don't know about it. So you have to be honest with us. Um, if you aren't taking your meds, you want to think about why not. Is it because you have too many? Is it because you can't remember? Like there's just, you know, you're taking, you got meds three times a day. Is it, this happens to a lot of my patients. Is it because you've, you're, you have a lot of nighttime meds or nighttime insulin and you fall asleep in front of the TV before you even get to your medications that day? I mean, that's very common. Because if you can figure out why, we can also help. I can move your medications to all in the morning so that you don't fall asleep in front of the TV, okay? Um, is it because you're having side effects? Well, if that's the case, we may need to switch to a different medication. Or is it because you can't afford them? I mean, all the time we prescribe medications. If you can't afford them, there's no way you're gonna take them. Nobody can afford $400 a month to, uh, for all their meds, right? So figuring out why you're not taking them is really important. So those would be the main tips, but honestly, be honest with your doctors. Trust us, we've seen it all, okay? So you're not gonna shock us if you come in and say, nope, I'm not taking my medication, or guess what, I eat a whole pizza every night. We've heard it all. So don't be afraid to be honest. It will genuinely help you get better. I think this is a really important topic. Yeah. Something that, um, even if, let's say you do eat a pizza every night, and you, and you want to keep eating a pizza every night, and you, and you don't want to tell your doctor because you're not going to change it anyway, honestly, that's okay. And I think if you come in with that information and your doctor knows that, then at least they can come and figure out a different approach for you. Right. Without that information, we're kind of going blind. Right. And if you truly don't want to change it, like you said, it's fine. Yeah. Then we will work with a way to make the blood sugars better when you eat that pizza. Okay? Great. Yeah, great. So let's see, where to? A lot of good options. You know, there was a few people that really wanted to hear about low blood sugar. So maybe okay. I can talk about that. Yep. I think it's um, an issue that, um, for those of you who, ha who haven't dealt with it, um, good, and you're lucky. But for those who have dealt with low blood sugars and continue to have it as an issue, it can be really scary and it can be really dangerous. So why don't we talk about that? Low blood sugars, okay, so I'm having low blood sugars yeah, and this may be some of the symptoms, actually, that people feel when they have low blood sugars. Everyone's a little bit different. Some people get one of these, some people get all of them. And uh, what, you know, the thing about these symptoms, shaky, fast heartbeat, sweating, dizzy, feeling hungry, uh, having a headache, being irritable is pretty common. Um, and as things kind of get worse, people start get, to get confused and maybe be acting a little bit different. Um, you know, all of these are possible symptoms of low blood sugars but they're not specific to low blood sugars. They could be from other things as well. So if, if you've never had a low blood sugar, but you're on medications that could cause a low, or if you've had lows before, and you're wondering if you're still having them, you're having some of these symptoms, the, there's one way to find out, and what, how's that? What do you need to do? Yeah, ch you gotta check your blood sugars. And this is actually, surprisingly, people oftentimes don't do that, and even if they really recognize their symptoms of low blood sugars, um, you still wanna check. And that's because it allows you to treat it and it allows you to go back to your provider and talk about it and say, hey, I'm having these low blood sugars. I have proof on my glucose meter. We know we gotta make adjustments to my regimen or to, to my medications, okay? So, so if you have these symptoms, always check um, and, and, and see what your blood sugar is, okay? So hypoglycemia is a real um, danger. And so it's something I wanna kinda stress that too. And so sometimes folks, 
who have had low blood sugars, first of all, you feel like crap. But outside of that, it's actually a really dangerous thing. So uh, it can lead to loss of consciousness, car crashes, falls, coma, seizures, and death. This is a real thing. Pe this happens to people um, all the time and people get into real trouble. Even some mild low blood sugars or low blood sugars, what, no matter what the, your blood sugar number is, but if you don't feel them, so without symptoms, can be causing damage to the heart and brain and other organs. So sometimes, you know, even if they're mild or you don't even feel that they're happening, this damage can, can be going on. So, you know, not to like freak you out, but it is something to be aware of. So what can we do about it? Who's at risk? Let's, let's talk about that. So a lot of the risk for low blood sugars depends on what medications you're taking. So think about what medicines you take for your diabetes, um, and, and, and then it'll help you sort of decide, hey, am I even at risk for low blood sugars? Maybe some of these symptoms I'm having have been low blood sugars that I didn't know about. So the, the medicines really that can cause lows pretty simply are insulins, any type of insulin, and sulfonylureas, which have been around a long time. We've used them a lot. They really help a lot of people. But medicines like glipizide and glyburide and glimepiride, um, the way that they work is when you take them, they're pills, they make your pancreas release insulin. So whether you're taking an insulin injection or you're taking a sulfonylurea that causes your body to release insulin, either way, the insulin in your body is, is increasing. Okay, so that's why these medicines can, can both cause low blood sugars. Not everyone that takes these medicines have lows, but it puts you at an increased risk. Um, medicines that, for, that we use for type 2 diabetes that do not cause low blood sugars include metformin, pioglitazone, which is actose, the, the DPP-4 class, that's like Genuvia, um, and Trigenta, GLP-1s, and the SGLT-2s. Okay, so these medicines by themselves do not cause, or in, very, very rarely cause low blood sugars. So if you are only on any of these medicines, sorry, then you're, you should be relatively protected from lows, but if you ever have those symptoms, you always wanna check your blood sugar. Now, let's say you're on an insulin and metformin, or any combination of these, you can still get low blood sugars because you're taking one of these medicines, okay? So just because you're on you know, uh, GLP-1 and metformin, if you're also taking glipizide, you still have to think about low blood sugars. Well, the other thing that's kind, that's kind of a bummer about the medicines that cause low blood sugars is they are the cheapest diabetes medicines that we have, except for metformin. But the sulfonylureas um, are really the cheapest pills that we have. So I have a lot of patients on sulfonylurea still because they're dirt cheap and they work. So if you're having lows on these, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to stop and go on an expensive pill, but you may need a lower dose or you, know, you may need a combination of different things. So it's just something to be aware of. Yeah, really good point. Okay. So one other thing that I kind of mentioned was unrecognized hypoglycemia um, or, or low blood sugars that maybe you, you don't even know are happening. So these can actually occur at pretty high rates in people who are using insulins or one of those sulfonylurea medications. They sometimes happen at nighttime and sometimes they're not detected at all because you may not wake up and feel them, okay? And we can see this, this is a download. Um, so later today I'm gonna be talking about continuous glucose monitors in type two diabetes. So this is a download of a person um, with type two diabetes and it shows basically, just to get you oriented, this is a 24 hour day. So we're starting at midnight going till 12 noon and then back to midnight. And each of these lines that you see is this person's blood sugars for one day. So that's basically a whole week's worth of blood sugars all in one graph. And you can see that, um, you know, yeah, they're having some highs on a couple days during the daytime. A lot of their blood sugars look pretty good. But what really, what I would notice right off the bat is they're having low blood sugars in the middle of the night. And they may not even know this. They may not have any symptoms and they might not wake up to it. So if this was someone that I saw and we were able to look at their blood sugars during the night, then I may say, hey, we should talk about adjusting your medications and maybe reducing the insulin or reducing your glipizide or whatever we think is the cause. So again, if you, if you have these medications and sometimes you check your blood sugars in the morning and you wake up and your blood sugars are low, 60s, 70s, and you're like, well, I didn't even feel that. That can happen, you may not feel it, but that doesn't mean it's something that you should ignore. So what do we do if you have a low blood sugar? So again, if you have any of those symptoms, you wanna check it, and then you wanna treat the low blood sugar, okay? So think of it as this is a medical situation and I wanna 
uh, take a treatment for it. Thankfully, the treatment is generally food, um, but you want to kind of do it in an organized way. So if you have a low blood sugar, a blood sugar less than 70, then we recommend taking around 15 or 20 grams of fast-acting carbohydrates. And Dr. Santos already showed you some pictures of what about 15 grams of carbohydrates are. But again, you know, like a, a, a good treatment would be a juice box. That's right around 15 grams of carbs and you can drink it. It's fast acting, you'll absorb it really quick and it'll help bring your blood sugar up. The 10 Skittles is another great option. Yeah. So sort of those hard candies that just have, you know, pretty much pure sugar is what you're looking for. You don't want to eat a pizza or something like that that has a bunch of fat and protein in it that's going to slow down the absorption of the carbohydrates. So you want to get 15 or 20 grams of carbs in you and bring your blood sugar up right away. Okay. The other good thing is use this as an opportunity to eat what you want, right? So if you love Skittles or you love, I don't know, juice or regular soda, I mean, if you're low, that's a good time to go ahead and you have an excuse to eat it, you know? So, but you just don't want to drink the whole can of soda or whole bag of Skittles, right? You really want to stay to that 15 carbs, but that, that's your excuse to eat, you know, a, your favorite things. It's nice to have them portioned out. So like yeah. a small bag of Skittles or a single juice, otherwise you'll just be chugging out. All the it. Halloween candy packs right now yeah. are perfect, right? So once, once you've taken that, then the next step is always repeating your blood sugar check because you wanna make sure that that treatment actually worked, okay? So you drank that juice or you ate those Skittles, 15, 20 minutes later, recheck your blood sugar, okay? And you wanna see that your blood sugars come back up to a safe place, like for example, above 100. And then, if it's time for a meal, it's okay to eat a meal. Otherwise, you can have another little snack to make sure that your blood sugar doesn't dip back down. So that's kind of a general approach to treating low blood sugars. And then the other thing is if you've had low blood sugars or you're at risk for them, like if you take multiple daily injections of insulin or you're on higher doses of these sulfonylurea medications, you know, you really should have one of these glucagon rescue kits at home. And that is to be used in a, basically in an emergency. So if your blood sugar goes so low that you're either really confused or unconscious, then somebody, you know, either a caregiver or a loved one needs to know how to use these to save you. So if you have, if you're the person with diabetes, you don't actually need to know how to use this. It's, the, it's, the, it's your type three or whoever might be around that needs to know how to use these medications for emergency purposes, okay? So this is sort of the old classic glucagon rescue that's been around for a while. It does require all these steps to kind of like shake it up and mix up this medication and then you put it in the syringe and inject it. And it works, but it's kind of a hard thing to do. And a lot of times people actually mess it up. Even healthcare providers get it wrong. Um, thankfully, there's some newer options out um, just recently. This pen just got FDA approved. I'm not sure it's quite available yet, but will be very soon. It's called GVOC. It's a, it's a pre-mixed glucagon rescue. So all you do is inject it and it's ready to go and it's gonna work. And then um, this really cool one is actually a nasal spray so that you just spray up somebody's nose. So if you had a loved one um, who was unconscious from a low blood sugar, you just grab this and spray it in their nose and it should bring their blood sugars back up. So these are all different options that um, if you have low blood sugars, you should have some of these on hand. Okay. All right, so when we asked you guys um, which of these things were important to you, I think a lot of people talked about not liking to check their blood sugar. And I have to tell you, when we have these shared medical appointments, this comes up all the time. You want to talk about it? Yeah. So um, I don't like checking my blood sugar. It hurts. Or I don't like seeing the high numbers. Okay. So what do we do about this? Well, the first thing I always tell my patients is just because you're not checking doesn't mean those high numbers aren't there. So a lot, it's kind of like when we're trying to lose weight and we're like, oh, I'm not gonna step on the scale today because I ate a box of donuts yesterday, right? It doesn't mean that weight didn't change. So same thing with your blood sugars. Just because you're not checking doesn't mean they aren't there. So go ahead and check and see what they look like. Um, don't be afraid to see those highs. In our minds, as the doc on the doctor's side of things, when we see those highs, then we can do something about it. Okay, so here's the, old, the kind of older glucometers that are available. Many of you may still have these. Um, these are um, the old way of checking. Well, not the old way. Many people are still using it. I shouldn't say the old way. Um, so this is where you take a lancing device, put a lancet in there, prick your finger, and then you get a reading. Um, and so a lot of people 
don't like doing that because it hurts or because they don't want to see their numbers. But I'll say, if you look at this summary, now this is a download from the doctor's office, and what you can see is this time here, it's too small to see, but right around the morning time, this patient's checking their blood sugar maybe every other day, and the average blood sugar is 200s to 300s, sometimes 400s. And the average reading out on this meter is 341, okay? Now, you may say, whoa, that seems like really high blood sugars. And do you know what I said to this patient when they came in and I saw this download? I said, congratulations, because now I can see your blood sugars. So this patient had been coming to me for a few months, and the A1C was always above the goal, but I really didn't have an idea of how high it was or what the numbers really looked like and they never wanted to check their blood sugar. And after we had a lot of discussions, they finally checked their blood sugar, and I'm so happy about it, because when I can see that data, I can do something about it. So this makes me excited, and I have to congratulate, because that's a huge step, to go from never checking to checking your blood sugar and really seeing those numbers is a big step. So when should you check your blood sugar? Well, if you're only on metformin and your A1C is near the goal, you really don't need to check all that often, unless you're interested. Then it's great to check, because you can learn a lot about what food does to your body, what exercise does to your body, just by checking. If you're not on insulin, um, you can check every morning. Sorry, if you're, that should say if you're on insulin, not if you're not on insulin, but you should check, if you're on insulin, you should check every morning and occasionally at bedtime. If you're adjusting your basal insulin, you should check every morning. And if you're on multiple daily doses of insulin, like insulin with meals plus a once a day insulin, then you really wanna check before every meal and probably at bedtime. And I will tell you the single most important time you can check, okay? This is an action item for all of you today. When you eat your favorite indulgence food, whatever that is, we talked about eating a whole pizza, we talked about ice cream, could be Krispy Kreme, could be going out to your favorite Chinese food restaurant, whatever it is, I am giving you permission to check your blood sugar after that meal, okay? Go ahead and eat it, go ahead and check your blood sugar. Then check it again another time when you have a meal that's maybe a little more healthy and learn what's happening to your body. It doesn't mean you can never have Chinese food again. It just means maybe next time you saw those numbers, maybe next time you don't wanna see those numbers, and so you may eat just a little bit less. But it really can modify your behavior a little bit. Yes? Is it like before you sit down? Yeah, so good question. When should you check after a meal? Really, you know, one to two hours after a meal is probably a good time to check. They say two hours after a meal. Um, but any time in that kind of one to two hour period after, you're going to see it. Um, what about those of you that say, I don't like checking because it hurts, right? It does hurt to check your blood sugar. I don't have diabetes, but I've checked my blood sugar a lot, and it does hurt. I'll tell you, I'm a baby. Like, my fingers feel sore, you know, during the day afterwards. Um, so luckily, we have these new devices that I mentioned this morning, the continuous glucose monitors where you literally don't have to stick your finger anymore. So you can put on one of these sensors, you can wear it for 10 to 14 days, depending on which one you have, and it's checking your blood sugar all the time. And this is where you can really learn a lot. And I've worn these things too, and I will tell you, do you, has anybody ever had those um, Belveda breakfast biscuits? Have you ever had them? They have them in our, um, in our lounge at the hospital as well, try them. Yeah. But anyway, they're basically cookies, okay? They call them breakfast biscuits or something, but they're essentially cookies. Oh, uh, yeah, I've had those. I thought they were, I thought those were like a healthy breakfast snack. Yeah, exactly, they look like a healthy breakfast snack. So anyway, I was wearing one of these continuous glucose monitors one time, and I don't have diabetes, and I ate one of those, and my blood sugar just kept going up and up and up and up, and I was going, when is this gonna stop? And to this day, even when I'm not wearing these things, I open the little packet of those things and I can't eat the whole thing because in my head I'm going, I know what you're doing to me, you know? So, and I'm not saying it's gonna change your whole behavior and it's okay to indulge every once in a while, but check your blood sugar. Don't be afraid to check it. Those numbers are there whether you're checking or not. So go ahead and learn from them. Okay, this is um, 
a really complicated picture of what we see as doctors, but you can download as a patient too. So this is a Freestyle Libre. This is another kind of continuous glucose monitor. But you can notice things like this patient's having hypoglycemia 25% of the day. That's a lot of hypoglycemia. So it may be picking that up at night. This patient who um, had a different download here, you can see trends if you look at downloads with these continuous glucose monitors. So this patient is typically high after breakfast every day. So that's something we can do something about. Maybe they need a little more insulin with breakfast. Maybe if they're not on insulin, they need to adjust their breakfast a little bit. So there's things we can really learn from this. And if you want to learn more about the continuous glucose monitors, Dr. Bader here, Schaefer, is going to be giving a talk all about this this afternoon for the whole session. Yeah, great. All right. Okay. Let's see. We're doing pretty good. Okay. So insurance companies, and you can talk about this a little more in the session, but insurance companies, it depends on the insurance. Many private insurance companies are covering continuous glucose monitors for type 2. Medicare covers it if you're on multiple injections of insulin a day. For now, they don't cover it for everybody yet. And I always like to say yet, because my daughter's third grade teacher taught them to say, if you can't do a math problem, you just can't do it yet. <laughs> so you always have to think it's coming one day, but yes, it's not covered for everybody yet. What do you think next, Schaefer? I think, well, I think we're gonna have time for both. Why don't I talk about heart disease? Okay. Um, so this is, okay, I have heart disease and I wanna reduce my risk for heart attacks and strokes. Actually, we all wanna reduce our risk for heart attacks and strokes. So this is, some of these things will be relevant to everybody, even if you don't have a diagnosis of heart disease or coronary artery disease, if you've never had a heart attack or stroke. Um, these are things that, um, you know, are important for everybody. And this was kind of mentioned earlier, um, you know, on the sort of more morbid side of things, you know, what do people with, with diabetes actually die from? And basically, um, almost, basically 80% of the people are dying from either strokes or heart attacks or, or cardiac related disease, which is a really high number. Now, as Dr. Santos mentioned, heart attack and heart disease is the number one uh, thing that people die from in general. So it's a, it's a really common thing. The problem is just having diabetes actually basically doubles your risk of having a heart attack. Um, or other heart-related um, problems. So, so it, this is a big issue for everybody, but um, unfortunately, just having diabetes puts you in a higher risk factor. So it's something that we really need to actively think about. Um, formatting got weird. So sorry this is small to see. But th this is kind of a general approach, and there is going to be another talk on um, protecting your heart later, and I think yes. they'll kind of get maybe more into some of all of these things as well, which is all really important. Uh, with uh, Dr. Juan Frias later. Yes. And um, so if you're interested to learn more, I would definitely recommend going to that talk. But when you're thinking about protecting your heart, uh, the ABCDs of diabetes heart care are kind of one approach to it. So the A, you know, stands for A1C, which really just means, you know, how are we doing on your blood sugar control? Are we in a safe place? Okay. Um, aspirin is also up there, and aspirin is sort of a very individualized medication that many people take for, for heart disease and, and prevention. Um, something that you want to talk to your doctor about. So if you have known heart disease, the general recommendation is that you're on a at least a baby aspirin every day. Um, but in, if you've never had any heart problems, the, the risk and benefit is not as clear. So something kind of an individual discussion with your physician of whether or not you should be taking a baby aspirin. Blood pressure control is a really big deal. The heart doctors, the cardiologists, uh, I think this is one of the most important things um, in terms of protecting your heart. So if you have high blood pressure, um, you really want to kind of get on top of it. Think about, you know, your salt intake. Think about the medications that you're using to keep your blood sugar in a good place. Sorry, your blood pressure in a good place. And if it's higher than it should be, um, then you want to talk to your doctor about that, okay? Figure out ways to get that improved. Same goes for cholesterol, all right? Um, Dr. Blancy said, that, you know, the LDL is that bad cholesterol, and we want to get that number down. So a lot of folks who have diabetes also have high cholesterol. They're, they very commonly run together. So hopefully you have some idea where your cholesterol numbers are. Um, if you don't, that's okay. But next time you're at your doctor's office, ask them about it. Make sure that you have those numbers at a good place. Okay, and then lastly, the diabetes medications themselves 
Um, we already kind of talked about them, but I'm gonna run through them again. Um, the ones that specifically help protect the heart, okay? Um, and then, <laughs> I don't know why it's all. So the other thing to think about is lifestyle modifications, okay? And it doesn't really fit in the ABCDs, but it's important. So again, that's weight loss, the nutrition, your diet, and your physical activity or exercise. So let's talk about the medications. So we're back to these same two classes. Um, I don't have stock in, e in any of these medications. <laughs> but, I don't either. But we, uh, we're not paid by the companies, but we really care about these two medications because they've been a breakthrough in diabetes care in the last decade or so. Um, never before did we have medications that we could use to treat diabetes that actually reduce people's risks for heart attacks and strokes, which is what the SGLT2s and the GLP-1 medications do, okay? So even the cardiologists are excited about this, and it's hard to get them excited about anything that's, that's not, you know, a heart medication. So um, the SGLT2 medications, we already talked about how they work. You basically, you pee out a lot of the glucose, but they have a lot of other benefits to just your blood sugar control. So they do lower your A1C, so we use them as a diabetes medication, but they also have a weight loss component, as we mentioned before. Uh, they improve your, improve your blood pressure. They don't have by themselves a, a risk for causing hypoglycemia. And um, they have been proven to help protect your heart if you're at risk for heart disease. Of course, as always, you want to talk to your physician about these. Each of these individual medications that are listed here at the top, these are the brand names, um, are, you know, they're all the same class. We believe most of the effects are very similar amongst the class. So a lot of it would depend if you qualify for these medications based on wh which one your insurance is gonna pay for. But talking to your doctor about these different medications and the potential risks and benefits um, is something to think about. And um, basically, the SGLT2 inhibitors, you know, they have all these different effects. Um, but by lowering your weight, by lowering your blood pressure, and by improving your blood sugar control, it's doing three things at the same time to help protect your heart. So this is, this is a really important class of medications. These ones, yeah, thanks. These are all pills. These SGLT2 medications, each one of these is a once daily pill. Yeah. Now the uh, GLP-1 class, so these are glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists. So hopefully not, none of you ever have to say that, but they're the GLP-1s, okay? These, um, with one exception that Dr. Sanders mentioned earlier, are all injections. And they can be, those are the brand names again there. They're either a once daily or a once weekly injection. For folks who have never used an injectable medication, um, I, I just wanna say, don't let that um, hold you back from considering these medications. Almost everybody across the board that I've ever had that have used one of these medi medications um, successfully basically did not have any problem with the injection, especially the once weekly ones, they're really, really nice. Give a little injection, you're done for the week with that medication. So these medicines also lower A1C levels, they help with weight loss, they do not cause hypoglycemia, and they help protect the heart. So in these big studies of thousands and thousands of people on these medications, they've shown significant re re reductions in the rates of heart attacks, hospitalizations for heart problems, and these sorts of things, okay? So these are good options for you, again, as always, in terms of the specific medication, it's a good idea to talk to your physician. This one um, that Dr. Santos mentioned is, is just, just approved by the FDA. Um, the brand name is called Ribelsis, and it's, a, it's the very first oral GLP-1. So this is the only GLP-1 so far that's been developed that will be a pill, okay? So if that's one thing that might be holding you back, this would be a good option for you. Uh, this medication um, is a once daily pill. It has really a similar effect to all the other medications in this class, the GLP-1s, in terms of A1C and promoting weight loss, and was just recently approved. Um, and it's, from, I've heard it's supposed to be available this year. Yeah, it's not on the shelves right this second, but it should be coming in yeah. the next couple of months, I think. So another good option from the medication side, and thinking about ways to protect the heart. Okay. So what does the American Diabetes Association say should be sort of our general approach to, um, to protecting heart, the heart, especially in people who have heart disease? So this, you know, they kind of say specifically with people who have established heart disease, that's folks who have had, you know, either a blockage in their artery or a heart attack before. But a lot of this stuff really makes sense for people who just have a lot of risk factors. So if maybe you're overweight, you have diabetes, you have high cholesterol, maybe you're a smoker, maybe you're an ex-smoker, um, but you have some risk factors for heart disease, uh, these are all, this is sort of the general approach that we use. 
So number one across the board, we want to think about lifestyle. So don't ever forget, you know, the diet's very important, weight is very important, and then we always start metformin as a first line in terms of the medication. But this is brand new um, in this last year that basically as a second line to lifestyle and metformin is considering either the SGLT2 or, or the, the GLP-1 class of medications, okay? And this is kind of the first time that they've actually worked with the um, American Heart Association to come out with joint guidelines that say this exact thing. So we're actually, we actually have a whole session this afternoon on uh, medications for type 2 diabetes. So that would be a good place to ask uh, if you have any questions about these. Yeah. Otherwise, we can be available after the session. Yeah, I'd be happy to ask, talk to you after. So this, um, if you have some, some degree of heart failure, congestive heart failure, or kidney disease that we talked about, the SGLT2s really are a great class of medications. They help all those things. And then either the SGLT2s or the GLP-1s work for people that have coronary artery disease or just at high heart disease risk. And then, you know, if you've started on metformin and one of those medications, and you still need a little bit of help in terms of just lowering your blood sugars, the A1C control, then you can kind of move on to any other medication that would fit based on what you're doing and what you and your physician think would be best. It could be insulin, um, it could be uh, Actos, which is pioglitazone, one of the sulfonylureas, that sort of thing. Now again, this is not taking into consideration costs and these sorts of factors, which is a bit, really important thing. So that you gotta consider that. But when it comes to purely thinking about the heart, this is the recommended approach. Okay. Um, Great. One more section. I think we have one more, one more subject left for our um, shared medical appointment. So the last one was, I don't wanna take insulin. It means I'm doing a bad job with my diabetes, or maybe you just hate needles or have a fear of injection. Anybody feel like this? So when we've talked to patients in these shared medical appointments about why they may not want to take insulin, believe it or not, these are kind of the topics that come up more so than the injection part and worrying about the pain with the injection. But some, a lot of people say this. They say, I feel like I'm a failure if I, didn't, if I have to start insulin. I feel like it's really the end of the road. I've done a poor job with my diabetes, and that's why you're putting me on insulin. Or some people have fear because they've seen family members on insulin who went on dialysis or had an amputation or it seems like something bad happened once they were on insulin. So a lot of people have this sort of feeling. And insulin's actually not the end of the road. So the American Diabetes Association recommends metformin first, which we've talked about already today. And there's a lot of other reasons they may recommend other medications second. But insulin actually is one of them. So Schaefer just went over this, but if, you know, GLP-1 and SGLT-2 are preferred right after metformin if you have heart disease, if you're overweight or obese, if you have kidney disease. Um, they may say take a sulfonylurea or actose pioglitazone if cost is an issue after metformin. But if your A1C is over 10%, or your blood sugar's over 300, or you have symptoms of high blood sugar, like you're peeing all the time, or feeling really thirsty, or losing weight, then the ADA actually recommends insulin right after metformin, or right with metformin, as a matter of fact. So insulin is not always considered to be like the last step, okay? Um, we have some newer insulins, just to get you guys excited. Um, that actually have some benefits. You heard about this this morning, but our newer basal insulins, Tegeo and Traceba, actually have some benefits compared to the older basal insulins. So these are associated with less weight gain than previous basal insulins and less hypoglycemia. Those are the two main problems with insulin, and these two are doing a better job. So that's exciting, I think. The other exciting thing is that we talked about this this morning as well, is insulin comes combined with one of those cool GLP-1 medications now. So you could, if you have to start insulin, say you're already on a GLP-1 or maybe you're not, and it's time to start insulin because some people, diabetes is a progressive disease, okay? Even if you're doing your best, even if your A1C is a goal, diabetes is a progressive disease. So many people will end up needing insulin at some point and they've been doing a great job their whole life, but it's just part of that progression of the disease. And if it's time to start insulin 
and you want to be on a GLP-1, you can combine those into one medication with either the Celiqua or the Zoltify that we talked about earlier. And then some of you may say, but doesn't it hurt? So it turns out that the needles on an insulin syringe and an insulin pen needle are tiny. And like I said, I don't have diabetes, but Schaefer and I have both done this, where we've checked our blood sugar a bunch, we've given ourselves, you know, insulin injections with saline instead of insulin. And I can tell you 100%, it hurts way less to give an insulin injection than it does to prick your finger. And if you meet type twos today, and you're not on insulin, and you talk to other type twos, talk to them and say, does it really hurt less? Was she lying? Does it really hurt less? But it does, and the needles are so small. Um, so if you're already pricking your finger, starting insulin injections would be nothing for you. We also have an inhaled insulin available now. Dr. Pettis talked about this in the type one track, but believe it or not, type twos can use this too. So this is a fast acting insulin. So it's not the once a day long acting Lantus or Tujeo or Chiseba. This is a rapid acting insulin that you would take at meal time. And the little inhalation device is so small, you can see it with this person's um, hand. How I mean, literally, you can put it in your pocket, you can put it in your purse. It's really easy to carry around. And you just take a little, you put a little, load a little insulin cartridge in there. It's very simple. And you just take a quick inhalation. And that's your insulin dose. So there's these options too. So we really encourage you to talk to your healthcare providers, your doctors, your nurses, um, whoever you're working with, and ask about these things. If you're interested in trying these different types of insulins, ask about it. But you certainly should never feel like insulin is the end of the road. It's just not true, okay? Insulin is a wonderful medication. It's the strongest medication we have to treat type two diabetes out of all of them. Um, and so for some people, it's really beneficial. So with that, I think we made it through our it? whole appointment yeah. in one hour with hundreds of people in attendance. Um, so before we go to lunch, thank you all for coming to this today, by the way. We'll be up here for questions. If you have other questions about some of the topics we covered, remember those afternoon workshops where you will get much more detail about continuous glucose monitors and medications, weight loss. Before you leave, um, I want to introduce Michelle Day, who's going to come up and give you some more information about this hey. afternoon. Great. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. I hope you've enjoyed the morning sessions. I just want to give you a few quick afternoon announcements. Now is the perfect time for you to find your program guide. You got one at check-in. On page four, it tells you everything that's happening this afternoon. So this afternoon, we have foot screening, we have Ask a Specialist, we have yoga, a cooking demo, all happening in the health fair. And then starting at two o'clock, we have various workshops. So you're gonna to wanna to take a look and decide what workshop you think you might go to. Up here, we're gonna have cardiovascular care. And then around this corner is where sleep apnea and cooking as well as we've got a workshop for all of you type three. So any type threes, if you wanna go diabetes etiquette, it's also gonna be around the corner. Okay, and then for lunch, we have a wonderful, kind of like a Cobb salad um, being served. If you are a vegetarian, however, please let your server know and they can accommodate. This particular meal is gluten-free. However, the rolls in the middle of the table are not. Are not. And if you need a gluten-free roll, just let your server know. We've got some of those as well. Alrighty, everybody, I hope you enjoy your lunch. Bon appetit and have a fabulous afternoon. Thank you.